All right, everyone, good morning. <clears throat> so I think today um, we are going to start right off the bat with a uh, with a Prairie Learn worksheet. Oh, I'm supposed to already be signed in. Why did it say that? Um, am I on there twice? Why didn't it sign me in? All right, I have to sign in again with my iPad, uh, but everybody can go ahead and, and load the uh, Prairie Learn worksheet and uh, read the question. Um, I will talk about the question while I'm trying to sign in. Um, uh, so uh, I can't copy and paste because I'm two, two different machines. 0425. 527, join. Okay, so the, the Prairie Learn worksheet that you're opening is about, uh, is about a problem where you have n balls and m urns, and uh, the number of urns is less than the number of balls. And, uh, and the urns and the balls are both distinguishable. So the first question is, so really this problem could be asked, you could go directly from this first setup where you have the n balls and the m urns, and you could go straight to question C and ask if all balls are equally likely to go in each of the urns, what is the probability that every urn gets at least one ball when you put in balls in the M urns? Okay. Uh, now, the, the problem is, of course, that that problem is, is quite difficult if we jump straight to the end. And so this problem is meant to be kind of a guide to how you break these things into stages and think about the different parts. First, doing the question with no restrictions, no restrictions being no requirement that every urn gets a ball. And second, then you attack the problem where you think about uh, this special case where you put an urn in each ball and then place the rest of the balls in all the urns. Uh, all right, so let me try this again. All right, it says that I'm on, join with video. All right, I think I've, I've successfully joined now. Oh, okay, um, no audio and uh, good, okay. So, um, so let's go ahead and and uh, start working this. I'm gonna share my share my screen. Uh, let's go to the Zoom page, and only the host can share in this meeting. All right, I'm having another another problem. Uh, all right, how many ways? Let's go ahead and have you guys work problem one A uh, while I figure out my my technical glitches glitches here. Um, how many ways can you can you put in numbered balls into M urns? No restrictions. Anybody, anybody want to provide some insight on, on this problem? What, what calculation do we have to do here? Okay, I think I can share now. Okay, anybody anybody have any ideas of how to do this? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, make a new page on here and uh, we will think about it. Multiplication principle. Yes, exactly. So I am going to, uh, for each of the balls, each of the in balls, I'm going to make a decision which urn to, to put it in. And so uh, which, um, which uh, so what is the, the result on this one? For each of the in balls, I choose, uh, choose one of M urns in problem A. So this is just, you're gonna put all the, all the in balls into the M urns and there's no restrictions. And once I've filled in, once I've placed an, uh, a ball in an urn, it doesn't remove, remove that urn from consideration next time. So we say this is uh, with replacement. 
Okay. So what is going to be the number of ways to do this? You guys, you guys, I guess this is now Monday since we had yesterday off. Okay, so in the chat, is there some, so maybe there's an answer for me in the chat. Let me see. Uh, M choose in. Okay, M choose in is a, is a reasonable answer and it's gonna come up, but M choose in would be the situation uh, without replacement. Okay, so we want the one in part A, we'll use that later, but uh, in part A, we just wanna put the in balls into M earns. So this multiplication principle would say that the answer is like this. We're choosing one of M options. We're doing it N times. Every choice is independent. So we multiply them together and that gives us M to the N. Okay, so that's the answer to part A. And, and that is, by the way, a, a huge number. Okay, if I have, you know, 100, 100 balls and, uh, and, and 10 urns, you've exceeded, exceeded a mole by uh, a mole of times, okay? Uh, so it's really, really quite an enormous number. Um, all right. So question one. So you guys want to enter these into Prairie Learn as we go through. Let me know if you need extra time to do that. Um, I have the easy job here. I sit and I write it down on pencil. And uh, I assume that all this Prairie Learn stuff is, is easy um, because, because Itchu does a great job of preparing them. Uh, but if there are any, any glitches as we go along, let me know. Okay, uh, now, now in part B, uh, we're gonna begin to break the complicated case into, into parts, okay? So, you know, the real question here, what is the probability that every urn gets at least one ball? I have to think about all the different ways I could do that. And if, if N is greater than M, then I can have a situation where every urn has one ball and there are hundreds of balls left over, for example. And how do you contend with the, the complicated situation. Well, you can break it into parts. Oh, by the way, there was a, a great question asked last time, why when we do stuff like this, when we break one of these things into parts, why do we then multiply the two results when the multiplication principle is kind of like something for independence uh, and yet the second step depends on what we did in the first step, okay? Do you guys remember this discussion? And I promised that I would follow up on it. Um, let me let me do a, a little aside here. So this has nothing to do with your worksheet, okay? Just before I before I forget uh, to go to go back and revisit this. Um, all right. So so this is this is the the basic idea. When we uh, let's say that the the first step uh, is to to do uh, I'm going to call it part A. You make some choices, and there's a number of ways to make choices in part A, okay? So I'll call that omega A, okay? And now in the second step of one of these procedures, uh, we, uh, we make choices to do part B, okay? And now what, what have we really done? We have, we have made an additional set of choices to do B, to do step B, given that we've already done A, okay? And when we multiply these together, when we multiply these things together, we get uh, the product of A and B given A. And, and that's like having done A and B at the same time. And in fact, this should look pretty familiar to you guys, right? So what are we, what are we really doing here? Um, what is the what is the corresponding statement in terms of probabilities? So this is in terms of ways. Okay, what would be the corresponding statement in terms of probabilities? The probability of A times the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A um, and B. Excellent. Okay, so it's really it it you know I I, I told you last week I couldn't really formulate it and, and make it clear in my own head. Uh, but after thinking about it for a while, uh, it does indeed correspond to, um, to conditional probabilities. And, and what we're really doing is, is making this first choice and counting the number of ways. And then there's a remaining number of ways 
uh, that is that is dependent on on what we did in that first choice. We've of course removed some, uh, but now we're making some new choices, uh, and and that's that's like requiring that we had had satisfied both of the two requirements from the beginning. Okay, so if you look at the structure of the problem that we're doing right now with the urns and the balls, it's exactly the same. Okay, you are in part in part B of the question. You're you're taking n minus m balls and you're placing one in every urn and you're asking how many ways are there to do that and in part and in part uh uh c of the question you're going to go ahead and account for the fact that you have uh m balls or uh sorry you have um you have uh how many how many balls left um well i have to have to think about that um so we have n minus m balls left and we have to place them in, in the remaining urns, okay? And we wanna count the ways to do that first. I, I think I messed up the statement about the what we we're doing in the first part. We're placing M of the N balls in the M urns so that we get one in every urn. And then we are um, in the next part, we're placing the N minus M balls, okay? So it's exactly one of these things where we do part one first and we can compute the number of ways for that. And then we can do part two. And then if we multiply them together, we get, we get the, uh, we get the number of ways to place all the balls in the urns with the requirement that there's one ball in every urn. Okay, hopefully that hopefully that that helps. Um, all right, so uh, part B. So we want to, um, we, in part B, it tells you a nice hint here. Uh, we want to place uh, one one ball in every urn. Okay, and so so we're basically taking, uh, we're taking M balls and we're putting them in M urns, uh, but which ball goes in? Well, in the first case, we have N choices. And after we've used that one, and we have N minus one choices, and we keep on going until we have placed, uh, until we've placed M balls in the urns. So this is now gonna be N minus M uh, plus one. Uh, and, and then, and then, uh, and then we want to, um, you know, we want to write this in terms of a convenient notation here. So this is omega. Uh, so what is this? What, what should I call this thing? I don't know. Uh, I'll call this omega one. Okay. This is to put one ball in every urn. <clears throat> All right. So there's a convenient way to write this. Uh, what did we, what did we call this thing? We called it PMN, right? And it, and it also, can just be written in terms of what it is in factorial over n minus m factorial okay you see how the replacement came in in this case uh you know i'm i i can imagine lining up the urns and uh and then i i say which one which ball goes into boat urn one etc and i've already removed that ball now Sorry, I should say no replacement comes in. This is the no replacement formula. Um, professor? Yes. So I have a question. Uh, so when we're talking about replacement and no replacement, are you talking about replacing the balls each time or the urns each time? Well, so it's, it's, it's no replacement. So the urns are distinguishable uh, and, you know, each urn, you could just you could just picture them. They're they're sitting there with numbers, and you have to choose which ball to put in urn number one, and uh, they're in balls at that first step, and and once you put that first ball in urn number one, you don't pull it back out, okay, uh, and then and then you have n minus one balls left to choose from to put place in urn number two, and you keep on going until you filled every urn, and that's where this formula comes from. So then for part A, are we assuming that we get to pull the ball out each time once after we put it into an urn? No, for, for part A, uh, for part A, you are you are placing a ball in an urn. Uh, so notice N plays a different role in the answer to part A. It's the exponent. Okay. So what it means is that you've done this procedure N times. And now in part A, it's convenient to think of the urns as the choice. Okay, so you, you have in balls, 
And for every one of the balls, you're gonna choose an urn. And it doesn't matter which one. It, it's convenient to do it that way. I, I mean, to try and think about doing it the other way, uh, I don't know, I, I, can't, uh, I can't imagine how, how to do that because uh, you know, the, the larger number here makes sense to, to put in the exponent because I have to choose you know, for every ball, there's an urn, but for every urn, there's not a ball. There's a, there's maybe several or maybe none. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So now in part C, we have to uh, ask what is the... Um, we have to ask what is the probability that every urn gets at least one ball when you put in balls in the M urns. Okay, so now we already have the answer to part B, uh, but we still have some balls left. We haven't finished this, uh, this um, procedure. Okay, so we have N minus M balls left. You guys do see the questions, right? I have not been writing the questions down. Do you guys see the questions? Yeah, we see the questions. Okay, great. Okay, just making sure. Uh, we have n minus m balls left to place in m urns. And we can place them any way we like, okay? Now this is back to the same kind of problem that we faced in part A, okay? So we have to make a choice for every one of these n minus m balls, uh, which urn to place it in, okay? So what's gonna be the answer? I'll call this step two, number of ways for step two. What do you guys think? You guys are very quiet today. Uh, all right, so you guys can type in the chat, you know, if you don't, if you don't wanna, uh, you don't wanna to show your voices. See if I can make this thing not full screen, make sure I see the chat. Can I do a zoom? Can I zoom in a little on my iPad? I'm sorry, I didn't know that question was there. I don't know how long ago it was asked. Uh, you wanted me to do this, and I think that I actually zoomed out. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, I just now saw your question. Okay, M, M choose N minus M. Okay, so uh, that, 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 uh, so, so there's a there's a couple of, of of clues that would tell us that 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 answer is not necessarily going to be correct um, in all cases, and you know it could it could possibly be the answer that we were looking for, you know, if the question was a little bit different. But but we know that it can't work in all cases because I don't know that m is bigger than n minus m. Okay. So, uh, so so what are the other other things that we have here? So. If you just think about, I really like when I'm doing these problems to try and try and envision the process. Uh, and the process has all these elementary steps that correspond to, to multiplication somehow uh, or addition, depending on what the process is. Okay, so, uh, so the process in this case is that I, I pick up one of the remaining marbles and I and I, you know, there are n minus m of them in the beginning. So I pick up that first marble and I ask, which urn do I put it in? And I made one of m choices. Okay, so I've accrued a factor of m. And then I pick up the next marble and, uh, and I choose which urn to put that one in. Again, I make one of m choices. I accrue another factor of m. And I keep doing that until I run out of marbles and so how, how big is that number? Wouldn't that be m to the n power? It's m, m to the n minus m power. OK, so this is the number of marbles. I think I called them balls throughout the thing. OK, marbles. And this is the number of urns. And uh, we are, it's the same as problem A. It's just that now we have fewer marbles, OK? 
All right, so now, now the, the ultimate question, the one that we were really out to answer in this problem is uh, what is the probability if I had not been careful to do these things and come out with one ball in every urn, what's the probability that it would happen anyway? Okay, and this is a really important concept that you guys recognize that when we count the ways uh, and that we are really, when we count the ways and each way has is equally likely as all the others, uh, then we are really counting probabilities, okay? So the probability in question, uh, so one ball in each urn, that's gonna be equal to what? Would it be one minus the probability that there's an urn that has no balls in it? Uh, that is a really interesting suggestion. You know, we could go through and rework this whole problem doing exactly that. And it's a nice example of how there's not one unique way to work these things. And I, and I think that that is actually quite a tractable uh, route to the solution to this problem. Um, so, the only thing that would be difficult about doing it that way is that I would have to compute the probability that there is a single urn with no balls, the probability that two urns got no balls, the probability that three urns got no balls, and et cetera, all the way out till I, till I, uh, you know, exhausted all the cases. But it 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 should work. It it might be tedious, uh, but but it it should be a correct route to a solution, okay? Uh, now, you know, in this case, there's a really easy route to the solution that just uses things we've already done. So one ball in each urn, we want the quantity we called omega one, we wanna multiply it by the quantity we called omega two. Remember that this is the probability uh, of getting one ball in each urn, uh, uh, given that I place all the balls in the urns, right? So I, I basically have, have required that I get at least one in every urn, and I also counted the ways to place the rest of them. Okay, so that's what we, what we did here. And then we divide by uh, the number of ways with no restrictions. Okay, so if we go through and we take the answers that we got for each of these parts, uh, and we plug them all in, we get, uh, this kind of complicated here. Um, so we get, uh, we're gonna have an N factorial, we're gonna have uh, that divided by, uh, I think it was N minus M factorial, and we're gonna have a factor of M to the power N minus M in the numerator, and we're gonna have a factor of M to the power uh, n in the denominator, okay, like this. And we can go through and maybe simplify this sum. The mn and mn will, will cancel here. And I will get uh, n factorial uh, over uh, n minus m factorial. And then downstairs, uh, we should get an, an m to the power m. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I never would have guessed that there would be an urns to the urns in the answer, right? So sometimes these, these answers are, you know, a little, little counterintuitive. It's not clear where that comes from. You know, it, I guess the point is, is that you, you can't really guess these answers. You have to break them into parts and, and work them out. And sometimes the final answer has things that, that look like you wouldn't have expected. Like this term, this term for me, you know, you, you develop an intuition over some years of doing these problems and that's not part of it. I, I don't, uh, no part of my intuition says that there should be an urns to the urns in this problem, uh, but, um, but there it is. And uh, anyway, hopefully you guys, uh, you love leaving your common sense at the door for this class. Okay, good. I, I, hope, that's a, I hope that's a compliment. Um, there, there are people who say that I leave my common sense at the door all the time. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's the end of the worksheet.
Um, and, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and learn about um, learn about Bernoulli trials. And uh, Bernoulli trials will be the last admissible topic on the quiz. Uh, and um, and uh, we will probably also today say a little bit about binomial distributions and get just an inkling of an idea about expectation values, okay? So we're gonna do expectation values all next week. Don't, don't panic about these things uh, for the quiz, uh, but you know we're just gonna get a little intro to them and then we'll do one more worksheet near the end of the class. Uh, all right. Excuse um, me? Yes. There's a question too on the worksheet. Okay. There's there's a question too on the worksheet. Ah, oh my goodness. I, I'm sorry. I did not I did not intend for there to be a question too. Um this is this is undoubtedly my mistake. Uh, okay, so I, I sent uh I sent Zichu these things and said we're gonna do this one. Zichu, what is what is question two? Oh, question two is about the fishing. Question two is about fishing? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do that one at the end. Is it possible, Zichu, for me to log, to have everyone kind of uh, suspend the worksheet and then I have to talk about Bernoulli trials before they do the fishing one? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that was the that was the plan, sorry. Um, yeah, so so you guys put the, put the Prairie Learn aside for a moment. We're gonna talk about Bernoulli trials and we will come back to, uh, to do the rest of the worksheet. Thank you. Uh, all right, so um, I should be sharing my screen here. And uh, this idea of Bernoulli trial, I mean, Bernoulli is, is uh, the Bernoulli family, you know, had uh, something like, like five famous mathematicians and, and one Bernoulli that you know of a lot is Daniel Bernoulli, because you all took transport and passed it and you know his Bernoulli equation for, uh, for uh, changes in pressure with, with flow and pipe and things like that. Um, so you know the the Bernoulli the Bernoulli family had um, particularly Johann Bernoulli had a lot of uh, crazy controversies surrounding him. So he loaned uh, L'Hopital notes on his he was tutoring L'Hopital in calculus, and you guys all know this story, right? That he loaned his notes to L'Hopital, and L'Hopital published them as a book <laughs> with his name on them, <laughs> and and uh, in the true spirit of what comes around goes around. Uh, Bernoulli then stole his son Daniel of the hydrodynamics equation. He stole his hydrodynamics paper and put his own name on it and published it. <laughs> and so, you know, when we talk about Bernoulli trials, it does nothing to do with the kinds of things that they might have had to go to court for. Um, so, um, I, I don't know. I, I find it amazing that that uh, that all these all these horrific stories surround uh, surround one person, one family. Uh, a lot of talent in that family, though, too, uh, no doubt. Uh, all right. So anyway, enough of enough of talking about musing about the Bernoullis. Uh, so a Bernoulli trial is a random experiment with two possible outcomes. And you guys are actually very familiar with these things. You probably use them all the time. OK, so a coin toss is a Bernoulli trial. And the uh, we talk in Bernoulli trials about uh, the probability of a success and a probability of a failure. OK, so you arbitrarily can design to designate which one you think is a success and which one is a failure. Sometimes it's pretty clear which one which one uh, would correspond to a success and a failure, but sometimes it's arbitrary. Okay, so, you know, heads and tails are the two outcomes of a coin toss. And unless you have a very bizarre coin, uh, that is uh, generally always one half for each. Okay, so you use this to settle, uh, you know, who gets the ball first in the Super Bowl, for example. Um, and uh, this is something that we use all the time. Okay, it's an it's an equal game, uh, a fair game. You you toss and you get one of these two outcomes, and everybody trusts that there's uh, that it's not rigged. Uh, all right. So another example. Uh, well, actually, this is a non-example. Is rock paper scissors. Okay, so it's used in very much similar kind of situations. Uh, you know, you try to decide it's it's 3 a.m. and somebody has to take the dog out to pee. Who does it? My wife and I do rock paper scissors. And, uh, and, you know, this is not a Bernoulli trial because there's a possibility that we can tie, okay? So the probability that I can win is one third, the probability that I lose is one third, and the probability that we tie is one third. And so there are three possible outcomes, and that, that means that this is not a Bernoulli trial, okay? Now, the, the probabilities don't always have to be even, okay? So if you are taking a multiple choice exam, 
uh, like on Thursday, and there are four options on your exam. Uh, you are doing, a, and you're guessing, if you're just guessing, then you're doing a Bernoulli trial. And the probability of success is one fourth, and the probability of failure is three fourths, okay? So lots of Bernoulli trials are everywhere. You can break down all kinds of complicated uh, stochastic situations into a series of, or a series or a collection of Bernoulli trials. And we're going to, uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna often refer generically to the two outcomes in a Bernoulli trial as a success or as a failure. And we will call the parameter, we will call the probability of success, the P parameter, okay? So this is the Bernoulli parameter. And uh, it's gonna appear in lots of the, lots of the formulas that we're gonna derive going forward in the class, you're gonna see this little parameter P that corresponds to the, the probability of a success in a given Bernoulli trial. And, uh, and of course the formulas get a lot more complicated than P uh, because, they, uh, because they involve many Bernoulli trials done in various, various uh, sequences that depend on the ones before and you have to think about all this stuff. But, but in essence, the, you boil it all down into a, a, a set of rules for using and, and acting based on these Bernoulli, Bernoulli trials. Uh, all right, and so of course, then one minus p is the probability of failure. And the, the key thing there being that there are only two possible outcomes. You either have a success or you have a failure. So axioms say that those two have to add to one. Uh, I hear a question, I think. Could I I'm zoom sorry, in? Would you be able to zoom in? It's a little hard to see. Oh, yes, thank I'm you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, all right. So uh, uh, how much of that do I need to, to uh, go back over? Um, all right, so, uh, so there's the, the coin toss example, the uh, rock, paper, scissors example. Coin toss was half and half, and it is a proper Bernoulli trial. Rock, paper, scissors is not a Bernoulli trial because there are three possible outcomes. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, guessing on a multiple choice exam is a Bernoulli trial, uh, but the probabilities are not, are not half and half. They are, uh, you know, if there are four questions, it's one fourth and three fourths. All right, so uh, the, the other key thing that I pointed out here is that this parameter P, we call the Bernoulli parameter. I will use that terminology throughout the, throughout the class. You're gonna hear this thing all the time uh, from now till, till the very end. And, uh, and so many of the concepts in the course and many of the familiar distributions that we work with can be derived uh, through analysis of these Bernoulli trials. All right, so let's do one really quick, easy example. So the binomial distribution uh, is one that comes up all the time, okay? So we're gonna consider a collection of n Bernoulli trials. Uh, and we're gonna suppose that the outcome of the ith trial is this random variable, this is a new concept, and we're gonna talk a lot about random variables next week. Uh, but for now, a random variable uh, is, is something that we, I'm getting an alert that my internet connection is not stable. Um, but for now, just, just know that a random variable is something that you, you don't know how it's going to come out until after you've done the experiment. Okay, so this random variable is designated x sub i because it's the ith trial. And it takes the value 1 if the ith trial is a success. And it's going to take the value 0 if the ith trial is a failure. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we, um, that we have a Bernoulli parameter that tells us what is the probability of each of these two outcomes, this Bernoulli parameter P. And now we're gonna define a new random variable K, okay? This new random variable K basically counts the number of successes that we got, okay? So K, in order to, con so, so K, if I did this in time, I don't get the same value for K every time, okay? Sometimes if I flip a coin 10 times, sometimes I'll get seven heads, and sometimes I'll get three heads, and sometimes I'll get five. And uh, pretty unlikely that I'll get all 10 heads, but it could happen, okay? So there's a different probability for each outcome K. And, uh, and so, so this K, I can, I can construct it by just adding the random variable X1 to X2 all the way out till I get to the end of this list, Xn. And you can see that because of the way we defined, because of the way we defined this thing, it's either one, it's one if the trial is a success, and zero if that trial is a failure, then what K is doing is counting the number of successes. Okay, so now I can think about what is the probability distribution for K, i.e. we're basically asking uh, what is the probability 
of each outcome uh, for each possible value of k. And so the first thing we have to think about, what is the sample space for the random variable k? Random variable k is made from a sum of in random variables, each of which has a sample space 0 or 1. So what's going to be the sample space for random variable k? Would it be 0 to n? Yes. OK, so if, if I'm really, really lucky, I can get all heads. And I would get k equals n. If I'm really unlucky, I get all tails. And I get k equals 0. And of course, I can get anything in between. All right, great. So that's the sample space for k. And now for every one of those places in the sample space, I can derive a, I can derive a probability uh, for getting that value. OK, so if I have. If I have k successes, I have n minus k failures. I want to multiply the probability of success on each of those k uh, successes. Multiply also by the probability of failure for the n minus k failures. And then I want to decide how many ways were there to decide to choose which ones were successes and which ones were failures. And I have to multiply all those things together. And that gives me the binomial distribution. OK, so this binomial distribution is a uh, it includes just a bunch of familiar parts. Uh, there's the multiplication principle sitting in this part. And this is your counting principle in choose K. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell. Uh, I can't tell and I'm not concerned with uh, which order uh, the successes and failures were generated. I just care. Um, I just care how many ways there were to choose K of them uh, to be the, the successes. OK, so these are the parts of my of my binomial distribution. Um, all right, so this is a this is this important thing right here. Um, and, and that's it. Maybe I should have a, a box around this thing. All right. Important formula for uh, for you guys to to uh, you don't you don't I will give you a a a, um, a table of formulas and properties of the distributions. Uh, but you know this is one that's that's easy enough that you might be able to just remember and uh, and work with as you see it. Um, all right. So how can you think about what's going on here? Well, there's a there's a device actually for generating this, and and you know I don't, maybe some of you guys have seen them. It's called a Galton board, and you can think about you can think about a little pegboard that looks like this thing on the left. So these are little pegs, and if I place a ball at the top peg, and I allow that ball to drop to the pegs below, it takes a random jump to the right or to the left every time it hits the next peg. And if so, let's call a jump to the right a success and a jump to the left a failure. OK, so now what's going to happen is that, you know, I drop a ball through this through this pegboard, this Galton board, and uh, and I get some some cascade of, of jumps that looks like this. And what I end up with is that was a failure. That's a zero. This is a, a success. It's a one. Uh, so I get, I get zero, one, two, three, nothing, and four. Okay. So now if I go through and I number across the bottom, this was zero successes, one success, two success, three successes, four successes, five successes, six successes, and seven. Okay. And how far I go. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't go far enough to get a seven. Um, let me erase that. Uh, all right, so the, the number of entries here depends on how many layers of the Galton board uh, you include. So you know what, what I think is, is really wonderful is that this is exactly the same as a, it's like a mechanical generator for Pascal's triangle. And it really gives you a nice way of remembering the binomial coefficients. If you, if you don't like expanding these factorials, uh, then you can go through the first few layers of this thing without too much work and generate them by another route. Okay, so uh, so what what's happening here is that at the top, when it hasn't fallen through any of the pegs yet, there's one possible outcome. It's sitting sitting at the top. Okay, then at the first peg, it makes a choice, and I can end up over here or over here. I'm I'm writing over here now. Okay. Uh, and then it, and then once it falls to the through the second layer of pegs, then there's one way 
to end up going out here to the left. And two ways, I can go left, right, or right, then left. And that gives me two ways to be right here, okay? And, uh, and of course, I have one way, right, right, to end up, or success, success, to end up over here at this point. And as I go farther and farther down, you see that I always have to add the number of routes to get to the next, to get to the next layer below. So if I want to end up in this slot where this three is, I can get there by taking the left left route and then right, that's one, or I can take left uh, right, uh, right left, and then left. So the total number of ways to get there are three. All right, and that's why there's a three sitting here. And, and we actually learned one of these identities that gave the, the binomial coefficients uh, of a row below in terms of a sum of ones above. And it exactly corresponds to what's happening in Pascal's triangle. Okay, so it's a, you know, I, I, I think this is a, a, a fun little geometric uh, interpretation of what the binomial distribution is doing. So at the end, if I imagine, you know, for a single, a single experiment, if I collect these in Bernoulli trials and I count the number of successes, I get an outcome that looks like this, the drawing on the left with the ball sitting in the four, for example. Ball could have sat anywhere else, uh, but you know, this is the one that I drew, the ball sitting in, the, in slot four. Now, if I do it many, many times, I can make a histogram of the results that I get and they will correspond to the, to the heights in the bottom le level of this Pascal's triangle. Okay, so this is my little sketch of what this looks like after six rows of these pegs. And it looks exactly like the binomial distribution. Okay, the heights are proportional to that binomial distribution. Now, in this case, the one that I'm drawing, the way a Galton board works, it's for a Bernoulli parameter of 0.5 because the way the thing is constructed, the bowl has an equal probability to fall left or right off of every peg. Okay, but you could imagine uh, you know, tilting the board, for example, uh, and, and shifting the value of P to the right. If you did that, you'd get a binomial distribution for a value of P that was greater than 0.5 because you would have increased the probability of success at every individual turn. And that would be reflected in the shape of the binomial distribution that comes out. Okay, so this is, the, this is uh, my little sketch of what happens if you did the same process, six rows of the Galton board, but with a little tilt so that the probability of falling off to the right is maybe 0. 0.75 instead of 0. 0.5. Then you get a distribution that's skewed to the right. Still the same sample space. I could still have cases where it comes out at zero or cases where it, they all come out as successes and I get six successes. Uh, but you know the, the probabilities of these different overall outcomes are now, are now different. They favor cases with more successes. Okay, do you guys, you guys kind of see how this binomial uh, distribution works? Um, so let's say a little bit about, uh, about expectation values. And this is something that we haven't done anything, any formal, any formal uh, work on this, uh, but the expectation value is, um, is, uh, it, is really, really useful. You know, if you want to talk about, you know, I'm going to invest this much money and I have some way of assessing the, the probability that the, that the venture will take off, you know, what is my expected profit? Really important calculations to be able to do if you, if you go to Wall Street, for example. Um, but let's do a very simple example. What, and, and just, you know, appeal to your intuition here for a moment. What is, what do you think is the expected number of successes if I do in, in Bernoulli trials, and I have a probability P of success for each trial. What do you guys think the number the number of, of successes, expected number of successes is? So this is the expected value 
of the random val variable k. Okay, here was the distribution. P of k is this. And we're going to do a lot of this next week. But we're going to talk about expectation values. And one of the easiest expectation values to compute is the ex expectation value of the variable in the distribution itself. We can do expectation values of a lot of other really complicated things. It's often very useful to do. Uh, but this is the, the easiest one to do. And, uh, and so what is the expectation value of that random variable k? If the binomial process is in trials, each with a success probability p. Would it just, what does your intuition say? Would it just be n times p of k? n times, uh, well, so yes, it's, it's n times p. Okay, so I think you, you've got a p of k argument in there, um, but uh, p of k, so p of k is a, is a funny thing. You can, you can almost think of it like a vector because it has a value for every k. Little p is the Bernoulli parameter that tells you about the probability for each individual trial. Okay, so remember, in, in a sense, the p of k is this red, is this red thing. It's a function. It's a, well, it's a, it's a function defined on a discrete space in a way that makes it a vector. Okay. Uh, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a function that looks like this, the thing in red. Uh, okay. This is P of K. All right. Um, so I'll write it here so that I don't have to erase it later. All right. So this is our P of K binomial distribution. And, and now we're, we're talking about the individual success probabilities P that go into defining that thing. So they're, they're the things that sit right in here. So these were the little P's. Oh, I erased it. I didn't mean to erase it. Okay. So these guys are my, my Bernoulli parameters P. All right, let me, let me make sure everybody sees that the correspondence between those things. So that's my Bernoulli parameter P, try and distinguish it from a row. Um, all right. Uh, so, so this is the expected number of successes that we're going to get. And, and that exactly matches your intuition, right? So let's do a, a familiar example. I'm going to do 10 coin tosses and the probability of a heads on each coin toss is 0.5. How many heads do you expect to get? Oh, you guys know this one. I already did it for you, right? Somebody type, yes, good. Thank you, Sydney. Um, all right, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, five, you expect around five. Now, you won't always get exactly the number that you expect. And we'll talk about variance, uh, which is, has to do with, with deviations from that expected value. Uh, but you, know, you expect to get a number of five. And if you do it a huge number of times and you average them, you will get that expected value. Uh, so so this, is, um, this is this idea of an expectation value. Okay, now what we're gonna do is go back to our, uh, to our Prairie Learn worksheet and everybody remember this result, okay? Everybody remember this result about expectations for a collection of N Bernoulli trials. Really, this is for a binomial variable, but I think in what we're gonna do, it doesn't, doesn't matter that it's a binomial. Uh, it's just a collection of Bernoulli trials. Okay, so let's go back to the, to the Prairie Learn exercise. Okay, so this is a, this is a um, uh, I, I think this is kind of a fun problem because you start to see now in this one, how you can really answer questions that seem impossible to get an idea uh, to, to get a quantitative measure of something. And yet with the little things that you've learned already, you can do really seemingly difficult calculations and, and uh, begin, to, begin to get answers for them. All right, so a fisherman has a pond. Um, uh, this, this could be about me, okay? I love going, I can't wait till it thaws and I can go fishing again. Uh, so a fisherman wants to estimate the number of fish in his pond. Uh, so what he does is he catches a hundred fish and he places a little yellow tag on each of the hundred fish and he puts them back into the pond. And the next day, we're assuming that the fish aren't traumatized by this experience and they're going to eat just fine. Uh, okay, so the next day 
he returns and he catches a hundred fish with replacement. Okay. So every time he catches, he throws the fish back and there's a possibility that that fish will just go and bite again. Um, and he finds that 10 of the fish that he caught on the next day have yellow tags. So uh, how many fish are in the pond? So I like this problem because if I just asked you to devise a scheme to count the number of fish in a pond, you know, if you're like me, you'd probably think, well, this is going to be pretty destructive. I'm going to have to drain the pond and count them or something. Uh, and in fact, there's a statistical way to answer this, answer these kinds of questions. All right. Uh, by the way, people, people really use this, um, use this uh, in, in statistical dynamics. Uh, also, the earn problem, by the way, is, uh, is very closely related to problems where people compute probabilities of excited states in molecules. So the quanta of energy uh, have to be distributed among vibrational energy levels. And if you want to know what the probability is of, of seeing a particular state where, um, where all, the, all the energy levels get at least one quantum of energy, uh, then, then this is how you go about doing it. You, you convert the problem into marbles and urns, and you can, you can solve these things that way. All right, enough of, enough of my uh, blathering. Let's solve the problem at hand. Uh, all right, so what is the Bernoulli parameter? So, so we've already, so I guess to think about this process, let's just think about what happens on day two, okay? On day two, he comes back, he has caught a hundred fish and tagged them. And now if you think about catching one random fish out of the pond, what is the probability that it will have a yellow tag? It's this Bernoulli parameter P, but I don't know what it is, but I can write it down as it's 100, divided by n, okay? n is the number of fish in the pond. And if they're all equally likely to be caught on the second day, this is the number of tagged fish in the pond, okay? So for every fish that he catches on day two, the Bernoulli parameter, so this is the Bernoulli parameter, for catching a tagged fish on day two. All right, you guys, you guys see how this is how this is working. Uh, so, so now what's he going to do? He's, you know, not you wouldn't get very good statistics if you just caught one fish on day two and said, well, he he has a tag or he doesn't. I I need to I need to to get some reasonable sample before I can really say anything. Let's suppose that 100 is enough. It may not be, um, but let's suppose that on day two, he catches 100 fish. And uh, so on day two, he does 100 Bernoulli trials. Each one has this probability P, okay? So what is the expected number of fish that he should get? It's going to be 100 times uh, times this value of p. Okay, so we can expand that out, and we can say, well, that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, okay. yes. Um, are we assuming that he catches all 100 fish at the same time, or are we assuming he only catches one fish at a time, so he has the possibility of catching the same fish in the same day. Yes, he has the possibility of catching. Uh, okay, so the whole way this works is that the fish that he caught yesterday, he can catch again today. But we're also making the, that's probably a pretty realistic assumption. But the one that's a little more worrisome is that if he catches a fish on day two at noon, he can catch that fish again at one o'clock. Okay? Uh, okay, thank you. In reality, the fish get spooked and they go hide for a while. Um, but uh, uh, but this is the, you know, the, the problem tells you, don't worry about that. It tells you he's, he's catching them with replacement. And we're assuming that all fish are equally likely to be caught even after they have already been caught once. Okay. So we're, we're not going to worry about those things. And, uh, and in fact, you can go through and you can do some analysis to, to see whether you need to worry about those things. If the number, the number that you get here and the expectation is small, 
it's it's unlikely that you're catching uh, you're catching tagged fish twice. Uh, it's like a it's like a rare event squared in a sense. You get um, it's rare to catch the tagged fish again, and even more rare to catch the same tagged fish again. Okay, I, I hope that helps. Um, so it'll make a small contribution to your to your answer. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's go ahead and make the assumption here so that the problem is is easy and we don't have to deal with those complications. So we've got this huge number. Uh, what is this? This is ten thousand divided by n. That's our that is our uh, expectation value. Now I don't know that I actually got the expected number, but I know that I got ten. Okay. So let's put a approximate sign here and say that this was the expectation value. And this is the actual outcome. Now, it could be that I'm off by, you know, maybe maybe the expectation value, if I really knew the, the proper value of n, maybe this is 15. Maybe it's only 7, OK? But 10 is a good ballpark estimate, OK, is the principle behind how this works. And what does this allow me to do? OK, he actually caught 10 outcome in number of tags. Okay, this is the number of tagged fish that he caught on day two. Okay, so here we have data. Here we have formulas, if that helps, right? This is where we're using these two things, okay? Uh, and now what we're gonna do is solve for n. And we're gonna get an estimate. And, and in the class, you'll see that I, I try to be careful to distinguish the actual value of n from the estimate. This is this little hat is my way of writing that this is just an estimate and it, and it may not be the right value. And we're gonna quantify confidence intervals later in the class and be able to say it's the real answer is this many plus or minus this. Uh, for now, let's just get this, this estimate down. So n hat uh, is gonna be equal to, what, what, it, what is the answer? How many, how many do I think I have now based on my experiment? Wouldn't it just be 1,000? 1, 1,000 fish. Okay, so we have we have gone out and done an experiment, and without draining the pond and uh, and you know uh, killing all the fish, we've we've created a, a reasonable estimate for the number of fish that are in the pond. Uh, so so you know if you're a fisherman at least this is useful stuff already. I've never done this experiment at my pond. Um, how would the answer change if there was no replacement? Okay, so if there, um, if there is no replacement, then we would we would have to uh, we would have to uh, let's let's think about this. Okay, so let's try and do this again. If there's no replacement, so we have uh, the expected number of tags. Uh, we caught a hundred fish, um, so we've got. Um, Ah, let me let me think about it for a minute. It's definitely a harder question if there's if there's no replacement. Um, who who wants to help me out here? So I catch one fish, uh, and there are uh, there's some unknown number n fish in the pond. So I'm going to have n times uh, n minus one times uh, how many fish did I did I catch? I'm going to go down till I get to n minus 100 plus one. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, that, that's hard. I, I will have to get back to you, okay? I know it can be done using, using formulas that we've... Um, uh, okay, so it will be a little bit different. It will probably be close to 1,000. And the reason that I say that it will probably be close to 1,000 is because 10 is much smaller than 100. And so, um, so you know, you're, this is why I was also saying that it's unlikely that you're catching tagged fish twice. Uh, you know, maybe it happens once, but it's not, you know, nine versus 10. If you removed that from your counting, it, uh, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, so, but, but, you know, in principle, there's a proper way to answer this. If you assume that the fish, once they've bit today and been caught, they won't bite again. And we could put that restriction in and I would have to sit down and, and think about how to do it. Okay, so spare me the embarrassment of, of fumbling through in live time, uh, and um, and I'll, I'll I'll maybe maybe post the answer to that on the 
on the uh, website. Okay, I, that's all I had planned to do for today. We can answer. I can answer some questions about the quiz, perhaps. Um, and uh, and I think that um, I think that's I think that's all I wanted to cover today. I had a question about the uh, the problem we just went through. Yeah. So when I first looked at it, I'm just kind of curious if this thought process is a correct way of going about it. So my, my, my first instinct was that uh, since he catches 10 with tags on the, uh, the next day, that's 10% of what he originally caught. So you could just assume that uh, since 10% are tagged of what he caught, the original number of what he caught, the 100, is 10% of the population? Yes. It is, it is really the same argument. It's an intuitive route to the same thing. All we're doing here is putting the formulas okay. that we've learned about Bernoulli trials in action. Okay. Uh, probably a little safer to go through this route. Yeah. Uh, because intuition with these problems sometimes can can lead you astray. But uh, but yes, you are, you are doing exactly the right the right thing. It's the right logic. Okay, thank you. Expectation values will not be on Thursday's quiz. I'm just going back looking through the uh, the questions. Um, so I won't I won't put any questions about expectation values in here. All right. Well, uh, will the quiz be similar link to the last one? Uh, yes. And tell me, do you guys think that that is a reasonable amount of work to do in an, in an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes? Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, they're intended to be uh, about 45 minutes. So, you know, if if you don't get really stuck, you should be able to finish them well before the hour and 15 minutes. So I'm glad to hear that you guys are having that experience. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so you guys know that it's going to be about the counting. It's going to be about um, uh, perhaps Bernoulli trials will show up on there. And, uh, and I think that uh, I think that that's that that's it. Okay. Thank you. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and log off then if that's the, all the questions. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week.